Good afternoon and welcome. I hope you are not too tired to, for our last uh, discussion today, which is about investigative journalism and transformation of reporting during several last years. In this regard, we have two distinguished, one, I mean, the second is coming, <laughs> distinguished and respected uh, experts. To my right side is uh, our German colleague, Sebastian Mondial, who was one of the key, key investiga investigators in uh, offshore leaks, which I suppose you all know about. And to my, right si uh, to my left side, sorry, is a uh, man who saved Osiek, I would say, Drago Hedl, my colleague and friend, and I have uh, a real big pl 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 pleasure to introduce both of uh, the gentlemen to you. Instead of me explaining uh, how it was during the last uh, uh, three decades in journalism in this country, I would start with Drago and ask him to remind us uh, how was it in July 1991 on this afternoon when it turned out that it, 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 it was your last day as uh, chief editor of Glas Slavonije in Osijek daily? Please, Drago, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the question uh, is very simple, but the answer will be probably a little more complicated. Uh, because, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that in that time, which Boris mentioned in uh, July 1991, I was editor-in-chief of a local daily newspaper, Glas Slavonije, based in Osijek. So in that time, it was, it was almost, uh, I would say in that time, in July, uh, the war in Osijek already started. Uh, we were in a pretty uh, uh, bad situation because we were uh, surrounded by the uh, Serbian forces and the uh, forces of uh, Yugoslav National Army. And uh, this atmosphere also uh, uh, made impact on uh, our newspaper. Uh, we uh, tried to uh, keep uh, our editorial policy. Uh, I would I would say that we didn't accept the editorial policy which uh, were, uh, which somebody or, or from the politics tried to uh, uh, put on us because we uh, we didn't want to uh, accept a war propaganda and also we didn't want to uh, uh, situation which already was very bad make worse. <clears throat> so uh, I had a problem with the local policy and uh, they always tried uh, from our journalists, they always ask our journalists to write that uh, all the Serbs are, you know, uh, uh, our enemies, that uh, they are responsible for the things which uh, are going in Osijek. Uh, but we didn't want to accept that, and that was the reason why I had to uh, uh, went from the office, and why uh, the one of the most, most powerful men in that time in Osijek, Branimir Lavash, who was formerly secretary of the defense in Osijek, but he was much more. Uh, he came with a group of the soldiers in uh, our uh, newspaper, and uh, that was uh, the way how I uh, how I uh, left the the office and. Uh, how the, he and his uh, people uh, took over uh, our newspaper. Can you explain how that happened? They came and what happened then? Uh, that came how and they, uh, like they and came so and they, they, uh, and they uh, brought with them a new editor-in-chief who was a journalist of uh, uh, Slobodin Tjednik, uh, which is well-known weekly in that time in Croatia, who was, you know, uh, doing all of which we didn't want to do. So uh, they, uh, they bring the new editor-in-chief and they told to the people that from tomorrow uh, they will have a new editor-in-chief. Uh, so we'll have a new editorial policy which will uh, be uh, pro-Croatian. Uh, and uh, that was the way how, we, uh, how I left the, left the newspaper. Uh, how Glavaš and his men looked like? Were they polite? Were they uh, in I wasn't, civil suits? I wasn't, there. I wasn't there in that time because it happened in the afternoon. Sorry? You were there? So maybe Brankica, who was journalist at the time, <laughs> can explain a little, a little uh, more plastic than me. I wasn't there at the time. I, it was in the afternoon time. He came to the office, and the secretary uh, was there. Uh, she offered them coffee and uh, mineral water. 
and they uh, didn't want to take coffee, just a mineral water, but the, the water should be, you know, uh, with the closed. Closed, closed. Yeah, yeah. So they were afraid maybe that somebody will do something bad for them. Right. So uh, that, was, that was the way how they came with the guns, you know, and um, I just heard from the people like Brankitsa and other how it really looked like. So Brankitsa, you were there, really? Were they armed? How did they look like? You mean they didn't kill you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, does it mean that you were fired then, or you continued to work in Latvia? No, uh, just a couple of days later, I went to split to Slobodna Dalmacija and asked editor-in-chief uh, Joško Kulušić, uh, whom I know from b before, and asked him that did he had a job for me. And he said, yes, of course, I do have a job for you. Uh, you will be... Uh, our war correspondent from Slavonia. And uh, the whole war in Croatia I spent as a war reporter for Sloboda Dalmacija, daily newspapers based in Split. So I didn't left the job, which was very helpful. Uh, it was very uh, good for me because otherwise I didn't know, uh, I don't know how, uh, how I survived during the war time. Does it mean that you stayed in, uh, independent journalist in the political sense in Osijek all the time uh, throughout the war? Yes, I was all the time, uh, uh, spent all, almost all the time spent in Osijek. I also traveled around, uh, even in Bosnia and uh, uh, in the most uh, dangerous uh, parts of Croatia at that time. So I wrote uh, regularly for the Slobodan Dalmatia newspaper. But it, wasn't, but it wasn't easy because uh, uh, Glavash and his uh, people uh, didn't want to give me information. I had a problem when I wanted to travel around. I had to ask for the permission, special permission. Uh, so it was a pretty hard time for me. Did you have good uh, cooperation with other journalists, or you were on your own? Well, How was it? well, uh, some of them were even afraid to talk to me um, because I was some kind of a public enemy <coughs> or a state enemy. Uh, but also, I, I, I have to be honest and, and uh, tell that I had uh, some friends who helped me, who gave me information, who helped me doing the journalistic job in that time. Uh, but uh, uh, the people from my newspapers, uh, with some exceptions, maybe a few of them, uh, even didn't want to, to, to have any business with me because they were afraid that, uh, you know, this, the enemy of my enemy is uh, my friend. So that was, that was the way how they behaved. So it stayed like that throughout the 90s. You lived in Osijek, you discovered uh, hard things, so on? Yes, I live in Osijek, but, but in that time, at the beginning of the war, we didn't know what really happened uh, during, during, in that time, because uh, uh, so many people have been killed uh, uh, during, the war, uh, during the war in Osijek, because, as I already said, we have a, a very specific situation there because we were surrounded by three sides from the Serbian, sources, from Serbian forces and from the GNA. Uh, and, uh, uh, you, you know, it was, uh, th that was almost always uh, happened. Uh, the shellings happened just, uh, uh, didn't, we didn't know when the shellings will start. So uh, when people were going to the job or just going to the, sh to, to the uh, uh, shops or, or, or some th other things to do on the street, uh, you could be killed very easily. Uh, I think about six, uh, 600 uh, people has been killed, civilians, had been killed also during the war time. So uh, also in that time, uh, some Serbs left, uh, left Osijek because they were afraid for their security. Uh, and we didn't know uh, who of them left and who of them maybe was killed. Later, two or three years uh, after, that, after that, uh, the war stopped, we uh, had some information that uh, war crimes happened in Osijek. And then I started to investigate some war crimes which happened there. So when did you uh, first, if you can remember, when did you uh, hear for the first time that something uh, that Croatian forces committed war crimes in Osijek? Well, uh, I will show you. Uh, I will show you the the article from um, uh, Slobodni Tjednik, which I mentioned already, and. Uh, it was, a, it was a story published in 1991, at the very beginning of the war. Uh, uh, the story, the story uh, told that uh, 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 it was a Serbian terrorist wanted to kill Glavaš in his office. 
w uh, this story was very funny. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, it wasn't funny, but it sounds funny because uh, Glavoš uh, had in that time a uh, guard who protected him all the 24 hours a day. And uh, this terrorist, which you can see on the picture, uh, was described as a very dangerous one. But if you look much, if you look uh, close and if you look better, you will see it is a uh, man who who uh, has a white uh, shirt with a, with a short sleeves, who who is uh, pretty fat, and also who could be probably between 60 and 65 years old. It's a it's a typical it's a typical uh, terrorist. Uh, the story uh, told that uh, he uh, uh, came very near to the Glavas uh, head headquarters to his office and that he wanted to kill him uh, carrying a gun, you know, a rifle. And uh, the journalist who wrote the story uh, did it very uh, precisely, uh, uh, with a lo lot of details. Uh, so it was, it, it looks like, uh, you know, like uh, it really happened. Uh, but uh, in that time, uh, uh, the story told that, that this guy was from uh, Palacha, which is a Serbian village, I mean, it's a village mostly populated by Serbs close to Osijek. But in that time, uh, uh, we, uh, we couldn't go there because it was occupied, and uh, uh, Serbian forces uh, kept the, this territory. In uh, 1995, uh, uh, I told the story that this guy uh, didn't do uh, this thing, and I tried to investigate. But it, was, it wasn't easy because all uh, the sources were so closed. People didn't want to talk about that. And it wasn't uh, possible to get uh, a lot of information. But when uh, the peaceful uh, reintegration of the Eastern Slavonia finished in 1998, uh, I, I, I was able to go, uh, uh, to go there to visit the territory and ask the people, uh, and ask him, uh, ask the people from this village from Palacha, did they know uh, the man from the picture? They told me that uh, they know him, but the, that it wasn't the name which was mentioned in the newspaper because the newspaper uh, mentioned a name, George Petrovic, but uh, the people from village uh, who know the guy from the, from the picture told me that, it, that his name was uh, uh, Chedomir Vučković. So it was a completely com uh, com confusion. Uh, and uh, I couldn't get uh, information who was really on the picture. I asked some soldiers who were uh, in that time uh, in Osijek and they, t they, they told me, don't uh, dig, don't, don't, don't ask about it. We don't want to talk about that. It was, and uh, it happened, and we, we couldn't change that, so just forget it. So that was, you said, in 1995. This story was published in 1991, and this book was published in, 90, uh, in 2010. 2010, 2010 yes. was it? This book is the result of, of many years of uh, uh, Drago's investigations of that uh, case, which ended not only with this book, but all but also with Branimir Glavaš in, in prison. So we could talk uh, very long about that uh, long, long Drago's investigation, but I will ask Drago to try to, uh, to summarize basic methods with which you discovered that story. Yes, uh, as I already told, uh, the sources were closed. You couldn't get uh, uh, information from the government, from the police, from the army. Uh, Especially in that time, in that time we even didn't have uh, this uh, law which uh, offers you to get the information from the public information. So uh, also it wasn't easy to get information from the people because people were afraid. I would just uh, illustrate uh, how, how it was when you ask somebody uh, uh, about this story or some other things which happened in Russia during the, the time because you know they were talking about uh, what, what happened and when they uh, uh, should mention uh, Glavas. They say well, like that. They, they whisper. They, they told me, blah 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 blah. Glavas, mm -hmm. you know, because they, they even were afraid to, to uh, tell his name loudly. Uh, uh, I was lucky because uh, when uh, Glavas uh, left uh, the Croatian Democratic Union, leading leading party in Croatia in the time which was in the power, uh, he lost the, the umbrella which covered him, which covered him, and. Uh, he was, you know, just on the, he was just on the open, open field. Uh, so in that time, uh, one of the soldiers who belonged to his uh, brigade called me. Uh, I was just, I was just in, I was just, uh, uh, it, was the day, it was on the day when I started my journey to Peru in, in, in uh, Latin America. I was, 
I was pre preparing for, for this trip. Excuse and me, excuse me, yes? it was 2005, right? 2005, yes. yes, yes. And, the guy, uh, and the guy called me and, and, uh, and uh, told me that he has a very interesting information regarding the, this article, which appeared in uh, Slovak Technic in 1991. And he knew that I wrote about this story, but I didn't have a lot of information. So he, he told me that he, he's got a lot of information, and he's ready to tell, to tell me that. So, you know, I was just, uh, uh, I was in Osijek, uh, ready to start for Zagreb to the, to the plane, and then I have a flight probably in the afternoon. Uh, and, he, and he called me in the morning. So my wife was nervous because we were, you know, packing the things for the, for the journey. And I told her that I'm going to meet the guy. It was 10 o'clock, I should have left Osijek at, at uh, 10 30 or so <coughs> and I met the and I met uh, that guy in the cafe nearby to, to uh, close to my house uh, it's him he was the member of uh, Croatian police uh, traffic police uh, he was looking very young and uh, I didn't believe him that he was a soldier uh, in 1991 because in that time when I met when, when I met him it was in 19, uh, uh, in 2005. He looked very young, as you can see. Uh, he was 16 during the war time, and his uh, father brought him to the army, and he was one of the Glavash uh, soldiers. He told me that he was, you can see him now as, uh, as a soldier. He was, you know, well-dressed, he's a gun, uh, sniper. Uh, he told me that uh, he, was, he was the member of his guard, and that he, uh, uh, knew what happened in the garage, which was very close to the Glavash office. And uh, he told me that, uh, uh, he told me that uh, he knew the story, but I didn't have a time to listen to his story in, because it was just, uh, I had just uh, 50 minutes or so. So, so I, I, I made a deal with him and uh, asked him not to talk uh, about this to others because I was afraid that maybe some journalist will, uh, will, uh, misused uh, his information uh, and he promised me that he wouldn't when i went back uh, from uh, from my journey uh, in it was in three weeks i called him from the zagreb airport and uh, uh, asked him uh, did he talk to somebody about the things which he wanted to tell me and he said yes i talked <laughs> i said to whom he said to the state prosecutor <laughs> So he already uh, visited, uh, in the meantime, he visited state prosecutor, Mr. Uh, Mladen Bajic, who just recently, uh, uh, he's not, he's, he's just a couple of days. Uh, changed uh, changed the, yes, the uh, yes. And uh, uh, I was, uh, it, it was, it was good information for me because I knew that the guy is, 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 is speaking, uh, that he's uh, telling the truth. And when I went back to Osik, I, I immediately met him, and he uh, told me the story that uh, he saw that guy, which was uh, on the f on the page on the front page of the uh, Slobodni Tjednik uh, in the garage, and uh, uh, two soldiers were beating him. Uh, the garage has a door which was which were uh, uh, with, with some holes in the, in the door, and. Uh, the Kronoslav here, that, that was the name of the guy who told me the story, was uh, uh, trying to see what's going on in the garage. And he saw that uh, the soldiers are beating this uh, guy and the other one who was also in the garage, asking them uh, to talk who are their links in the, with the, with the, with the uh, Serbs, with the Chetniks, as, as, as they used to say. Uh, and uh, in one moment, one of the soldiers uh, took the uh, car, bat car, uh, car batter battery uh, accumulator. Accumulator. Car battery. Car battery. Car battery. Uh, uh, took the glass and uh, uh, put uh, the liquid from the car battery, which is poison, you know, and asked uh, and, and forced the man to, to drink it. So uh, that man, which is now on the, on the picture, <coughs> uh, was forced to drink this, uh, and he, it, was, it, was, it was terribly painful, you know. So uh, in, in that moment, he... Uh, he tried to escape to, 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 to find some kind of help, so he broke the, the garage door. And uh, Colonel Slafahir, who was a soldier, uh, uh, took his gun and uh, was uh, and, and shot uh, that uh, that man. But uh, he didn't kill him because he just wanted him, which we realized later. I will tell you how. 
why did he choose you? Well, uh, maybe because I wrote a lot of stories about, uh, in that time, about war crimes, and uh, probably he, wa he knew that uh, I will uh, take, uh, that I will, uh, that I will take this seriously. And he told me that he uh, believed me and that he uh, uh, wants me to protect him, not to mention his name if I publish a story, because he was afraid. He knew that he has a business with a powerful man, with Vladimir Glavaš, who at the time was a member of the parliament, who had uh, very good links with the uh, uh, top uh, politicians in Zagreb, and also he had a Croatian general. So it wasn't easy to fight with, uh, with such, a, such a man. How many deaths threats did you receive during the last two decades? Well, uh, not so much, but uh, some of them were serious uh, because, uh, you know, living in the small city like Osijek, you, uh, you can, you, 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 you will meet, you'll meet, you're meeting uh, uh, these people which uh, you, are, you are writing about them on the streets. So uh, it was dangerous, you know, because uh, Glavash had people around him who, uh, who were ready, you know, to, to do, uh, uh, to stop uh, my investigation. So uh, once I had a very, um, uh, I would say, a close contact with, uh, I, wish, I think I have a picture of him here. Yes. Uh, this guy, uh, Davar Boras, he was uh, president of, uh, 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 of the youth uh, organization of Lavash Party. So he met me on the street and he, uh, he you know, he all, all started to, to, uh, to attack me. But uh, I, uh, it was uh, lucky. Uh, I was lucky because a lot of people were around. It was in the front uh, of uh, my house where I was living. There is a small cafe and he was there. And when he saw me, he, uh, he uh, stood up and, try and uh, asked him that he was going to kill me at the time, uh, writing uh, bad things about a Croatian hero, that uh, Glavash is not a criminal, he is a hero, and things like that. So then, uh, just in a couple of minutes, police came and they uh, took him, and uh, that uh, was one of the very bad experiences. But also I received several letters in that time. I'll show you the one, mm -hmm. yes. This is the one I sh this one I receive, which means we'll kill you and your lever. Just for explanation, lever was uh, the guy who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, was telling the stories about war crimes in Gospić uh, regarding the Norad case, yes. and uh, he, as you know, uh, was killed in uh, in uh, Gospić area. So it was uh, uh, some kind of warning for myself that I would also that, uh, that uh, I will be killed also in the, and, uh, and uh, Kronofe here who told me the story. Also I received some other nice things like, uh, yeah, yeah, like this one. Yeah. Drago, thank you for now. Yes. Uh, we will continue later. While, while Drago and, and other independent journalist, uh, ju journalists wrestled with the war crimes and uh, uh, ki ki killers, p politicians, Seb uh, Sebastian was discovering the wonders of internet in Germany and, and in, in Western Europe. So, Sebastian, please give us the basic information about what you do. Yes, yes. So if anyone wants to ask anything, please stop us and, and, and ask. Sorry, I forgot uh, to say that earlier. Okay, good. Um, my name is Sebastian Monial. I'm 42 years old. I'm a freelance journalist and I uh, have the privilege of working for major news outlets in Germany and various things. Most known is offshore leaks, but other investigations most digitally as well. Um, as I do with all talks, I start with full disclosure. I currently have no non-disclosure agreements on anything that I've written and signed that I can't talk about anything else. And this is important to show any time because 
once this starts missing, if you see me anywhere else and this starts missing, then I had to sign something to keep things secret. This is kind of my back door, so nobody forces me to keep things secret. Um, I listened in a little bit for this, uh, uh, for this conference, and so since we're talking about the future of research journalism, um, what is for me translated also to investigative journalism, um, there's a general setting which I want to start with is, you know, it's always uh, looking for the needle in the haystack, um, at least from my point of view. Um, so the change that's generally happening is the amount of data is increasing that we journalists have to deal with, especially in, in research journalism. And the other thing is that files are becoming pure digital. Um, at least when I have to deal with a state or anything with big companies, then, you know, there's no paper involved anymore. Um, so as an example with offshore leaks, uh, I can talk a little bit about what we did, what the setting is, and then move over to what you might take from this and, and what helps. Um, so what's so special about offshore leaks? Um, for me, as a small remark, there was nothing special about it as it didn't happen to me the way you uh, as a recipient uh, saw it. It was a call from uh, a colleague saying, well, you get a call from some person in the United States that he will invite you over and that he will show you something and do you have time? And I was, yeah, why not? So I was flying over to the States. I have a conversation about a hard drive and then my work starts and it was about a year uh, that I could nobody uh, tell what I was working on and it was just, you know, at first a job and then it became an obsession and then became a interesting story. Um, the offshore leaks investigation is uh, something special that happened with the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which is, I would say, a club, uh, which you can only get into by invitation. Uh, it's about 160 or more reporters in more than 60 countries. Um, it's not that you can buy in with money, but mostly with investigative reputation or with an er area of expertise. I, for myself, I'm not a member. I'm an associated expert, you can say. Um, uh, and this is uh, an interesting concept that they somehow invite people with special skills over and to work them uh, on special stories. Uh, they founded in 1997 um, a project of the Center of Public Integrity um, I think it was the first project was about uh, um, tobacco companies, which were the bad guys in that days. They are founded by uh, money from donors, and uh, uh, so it's a kind of different um, uh, fundraising or, or financial model than traditional media. And they're focusing on the big issues, on cross-border crime, corruption, and what they say, accountability of power, which just means that local things happening aren't in their scope. And what Offshore Leaks makes so special is that it was a really huge amount of unstructured data. So we're talking about 2.5 million documents, which were of various file types, and not to bore with, with technical things, I'll show you a little bit later, something in scale. And it was like passports, contracts, legal exchange, but also private photos and other noise. And I read a lot of that. I couldn't read anything in Lifetime, but I kind of skimmed through it and it was amazing what was found in it. It was copied from two companies um, in the heart of the offshore industries. The companies seem still to exist to this very day, so it's more than a year that this investigation is out, but uh, the company is still trying to stay afloat. Um, and this tells you something about the industry. If the companies have still some secrets left, then probably some people will stay with them. Um, and it showed in depth that this whole industry is at least in a significant part made for tax evasion, made for secrecy that uh, denies the public a rightful money or knowledge. Um, and the key person is Jared Ryle, who's now the boss of ICIJ, uh, or the, the top person of ICIJ, um, because he got the hard drive. It wasn't at first the story of the ICIJ, but it was made a story of them. And in all those two million documents, the best thing you can find, okay, I jumped back, was this a passport of a person, and then you got a story. But to see it in scale, um, 
you have to say, okay, how much is 2.5 million documents? Well, imagine a Bible and then 10 Bibles and then a hundred, and then we go to thousand, and then we go to uh, 10,000. And this is like more than 50,000 Bibles and text in, in pure information and not counting countless images and other stuff we had there as well. So it's, it's that challenge that is so different to most of the things that happened before in cross-border investigative projects that it was so much that nobody could really grasp it. And what made me coming in, because I'm not really a special person when it comes to investigative journalism, um, but in terms of that I had an interest in technology that kind of scales to that problem. Um, but uh, before taking over the technical part, um, so the metrics that we had at, at the end was 100 journalists were involved in 46 countries. And as you can imagine, involving 100 journalists in so many countries has really challenges about communication. Um, you can't really set up an emailing list or do a conference call with so many people to get things organized. So it was really a challenge in that way. There were a lot of media partners who uh, did, when you look at, back at what happened, did a great job in cooperation um, they had some experience, for example, with WikiLeaks, so they already knew how to keep things secret and to work together, but this was, again, a challenge in terms of scale that you had to uh, bring all the people together. And actually, as far as I can say, there were no divas or uh, egos involved, so everybody played nice, which was a kind of awesome experience. Mm -hmm. um, we had the world release date for 4th April, so everybody started at the very same day, uh, telling their, their part of the stories, and everybody uh, in the week before exchanged all things investigated and written. Imagine that, like, they didn't really personally know each other, but they uh, handed over their research results from the Germans were giving that to the Spanish, the Spanish were giving that to the Americans, and so on. It was really interesting. And from this point of view, over the year, which we changed tax laws with investigation, we changed transparency settings significantly, and the relations between tax jurisdictions. There was a whole conference from Europol dedica dedicated to offshore business last year, and it was really amazing uh, to see that we really had impact. But offshore leaks, when you look at it, like you want to see from the uh, perspective of um, what's the future is the story of a hard drive. It's, sto it's the story of that uh, currently a number of journalists will get large amount of information about things happening in politics or in, in structure. And so you have to kind of see that you have to be able to work with that stuff. It's a story of too much to print. Um, again, I know a, a number of journalists in Germany were, are still my heroes in what I want to become, um, but they're purely paper-based. I mean, they have computers for email, but they print everything. And um, this is not, not so far uh, a story against them, but um, they're coming, becoming the classic model where the future model is working purely digital. And it's a story which is interesting for me is you can't do this with regular software anymore. Um, I mean, you all have your laptops with Office uh, uh, installed and some email program, but um, digging through this amount of information requires special software or programming skills, which for my part, I don't have uh, in, in the broad thing that I could everything in that do on my own, but um, only in collaboration you can do these things. So what we did, we self-created tools. So journalists became programmers or rigged some things together as you would do when you want to do something in the kitchen, but you don't have the real tools for, but you want to get it done. Um, it became a story of classic visualization from print media, but the information is fixed. You, you only can report about one person, which in this case is the network of Gunter Sachs, versus the dynamic version on the web. If you go to the website of ICIJ, you can research about 100,000 companies and about 10,000 persons and all their interactions, which means nobody is really special anymore. Uh, if you're part of the story, if you put in uh, uh, postal numbers from uh, Germany, then you see uh, the German stories from that region. If you put in maybe a Croatian address or Croatia as a nation, maybe you get some uh, companies who are here as well. 
So this leaves me with a prediction of a possible failure in journalism. Um, because the way I see it, we currently don't keep up with the information amount. I mean, there will be, again, always stories that only work with uh, eyewitnesses, with really special connections, with uh, uh, things that only can, was seen by a few eyes. But on the other hand, as uh, states get more digital, more di connected, as companies get global, there is this challenge to deal with the information. And currently we're caught pants down uh, as I see it. Not, this is not a topic in, in journalism school and um, problems of media working against it. So as I would put it, journalists need to learn again. Um, I can't really answer the question how to make room for it, but they need to learn. They need time to experiment. Um, an experimentation is uh, something where you try things out and see what sticks. So journalism needs information. And sadly, if journalists start to innovate, there will be failures. And this is what is actually something that is challenging about offshore leaks all the time. You might admire, admire the success of offshore leaks, but we had so much luck there that doesn't fit on any, any a number of slides. I mean, uh, everything from start to end nearly went according to the plan, but we had a really long discussion about the possible failures of offshore leaks because uh, we anticipated that some uh, journalists would go rogue, not that we anticipated anybody doing this specifically, but you know, if you hand the information to 100 journalists, what do you expect? There might be just one thinking, oh, I got the stuff exclusively, I can just you know, be the world first journalist to break the story. This is just possible. At least it is a temptation. Um, uh, people might uh, get uh, a hold of it bef before we break the story. Uh, the source might leak it to a second person. S this all could happen. So this kind of environment was uh, uh, really uh, a product of pure good outcome. But two things stick out. Uh, one thing is um, journalism needs good bosses. Um, uh, in corporation at least. And I don't think the kind of bosses that do like accounting management, but they who know um, how to keep people uh, motivated even if things fail and if things are difficult. If you're working for yourself, that's as I do, you need people who understand you need to take time, some time off to work things out or they can comfort you in even if you fail, you get your money. The other thing is having ex escape plans. And by escape plans, I mean this slide. This is actually in German, but um, I, didn't, I couldn't actually find the English version of it. This is a failure tree of everything that could go wrong, um, at least the, the, um, the first setup. Um, what we anticipated through a day-long session with all the original journalists. So we made a, actually a planning game, what can go wrong, and anticipated what we would do. This includes getting killed, threatened, everything, um, which was sometimes difficult to imagine, but nice to think about. Um, so you already have an idea how um, you would react or how the others would deal with it. So this leaves me with um, something that I would call um, uh, open source intelligence, that's something uh, is that journalism can't deliver or investigative journalists need uh, to have uh, some tools, um, some, some programming done, which we can't do ourselves. We need changes in security. I mean, we did this whole thing before the Snowden revelations. And we were so lucky we didn't get caught because we had a unique sec uh, security model, which I set up with a uh, British colleague, Duncan Campbell, um, that worked flawlessly just by chance and because nobody anticipated that. Um, and for that, last remarks. Um, as I was picking up what was discussed here uh, about the change in journalism, the problems with innovation is always, or with the future, that innovators waste time and do no actual work in, in the view of managers. Innovators are unthankful um, because they want to change and they're unsatisfied, and they don't create instant return on investment. And so 
uh, as you might know with complaints, usually this is the look of the complaint department in media companies, yeah? Take a number and then, you know, kaboom. And the other thing is, as for investigative journalists, I have to say, um, if you don't have this special setup that I really can't tell you how I got there because it was, you know, just studying computer science and then changing over to journalism and always doing the right things, but the right things were just for me, the things I did. There is no business model currently for uh, a huge number of investigative journalists, only good connections or being established. Um, there's nothing to copy. I mean, I, I'm supposed to, to train students from this year on, but I can't really tell them how to get to the point where I am because there's no really a way to, to go there. Um, so I'm kind of clueless giving complete advice, but I'm open to any kind of questions, suggestions, what we should do. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, now we got two, I would say, rather different approaches to investigative journalism. So please, we are opening the floor for, for your questions. Yes. If no questions, we can start. Please, please. Uh, hi, uh, Thomas Lafmartic. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, from from the UK, um, and uh, write on political pressure on journalists in Croatia from uh, 2000, from the year 2000. And um, uh, I was wondering, um, first, with with reference to uh, to, to your job. Um, uh, to, to what extent you think uh, the, the capacities, the technical capacities um, for analyzing such a massive amount of data, uh, you, you said there is nothing uh, you can kind of give forward, you, you, can, you can teach, but um, isn't there something, some kind of like algorithm software uh, that um, kind of was created from that that can be used for, f for future investigations to, to analyze such a uh, big uh, amount of data and I wanted um, I also wanted to ask uh, Drago Hedel um, uh, about uh, the way political pressure uh, on journalists uh, changed from the 1990s so your story was a very um, kind of like war character raw pressure very open very uh, very brutal, so to speak, and uh, so I wanted to ask uh, in what way that kind of changed over the years and maybe also o over the decades, to in what way it became subtle and what the channels are nowadays, uh, how, how journalists are, are pressured. Thank you. You go first. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think the situation, situation uh, today is much better than it was in 1992, three, four, or five, or uh, uh, because uh, Croatia is now the member of the European Union and during the process of uh, accession to the European Union a lot of things change uh, which made the situation better for journalists. It's not, not ideal, not, uh, not uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, not perfect, but the uh, uh, situation is much better now than it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the problem uh, uh, about writing uh, about the war crimes, it was specific because the public opinion wasn't ready to accept it, the fact that the uh, Croatian soldiers also made the war crimes. You know probably the statement of uh, President of the Croatian Supreme Court, Mr. Milan Vukovic, who told that Croats who uh, were defending themselves, their country, couldn't uh, make the war crimes. So that was the officially, it, and it, it was, it was uh, very hard, you know, to uh, write something which wasn't uh, uh, which wasn't in that uh, 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 way. So uh, later, when we started to write about uh, another colleagues, of course, Boris and some other people from other newspapers like Globus, like Nacional also uh, wrote, and, it, and then uh, the situation uh, became better and better, and now I think in Croatia you can write almost everything about, about everybody. But of course you can also expect some kind of prejudice, but not so strong as it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. 
So about your question uh, regarding uh, helping technology um, for these kinds of leaks, um, the problem is scale and frequency. So these leaks don't happen very often. So um, there are no kind of tools created for, um, for these things. You can only borrow something that is related which we did with uh, a forensic software, which is used usually by police and uh, the agencies. It worked pretty well, uh, but it's usually not affordable. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of euros. Uh, police usually uh, pays for that and place it at one central point, and then they ship the hard drives of the bad guys there to analyze it. And we only had one hard drive, so it wasn't really um, uh, something we could have paid. We got a donation uh, in this case. Um, but we inspired other people to maybe create in the future tools that work similarly. So I'm hoping for the best that in one, two, three years, there's something available for that. So if I may ask, um, Sebastian said something to the fact that you need good bosses and I would understand that as institutional environment wherein you have the conditions to uh, do your work, to research or develop. Um, so my question will go to uh, Mr. Hedl. Um, if he had any support in terms of uh, his newsroom and uh, if the institutional setting that he was working in uh, played any significant role or was it all onto himself to facilitate his research and secure uh, his sources and, and uh, similar such things. And did he had assistance in researching? Um, yeah. Well, um, I had the support from uh, Croatian Association of Journalists. Uh, also, I have the support from uh, uh, international organizations like Reporters Without uh, Border and uh, some other organizations as well. But uh, one thing which helped me a lot was the, in, when I was really in danger, was the reaction of American ambassador in Croatia, Mr. Peter Galbraith, who uh, called me one uh, afternoon when I, uh, and asked me, did uh, I want uh, his intervention? Because uh, in that time, uh, the, man we, the man I mentioned, uh, Branimir Lavash, uh, uh, told me that he is going to reduce me to the, uh, the ash, and uh, that uh, that was a re really a dangerous uh, uh, situation. And Mr. Galbraith uh, uh, promised me that he is going to call President Tujman and the Minister of Defense Gojko Šušak to uh, to make some intervention, and that uh, he will ask them to protect protect me. So uh, in that time, his word was very important, and also uh, later. Uh, some other organizations uh, uh, helped me with the uh, uh, letters to the Croatian government and uh, so on. Also, I had the support from my newspapers, which was very important for me, and also for my family, which is very important. If you don't have a, a support from your family, then it's pretty bad. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I want to ask um, Mr. Sebastian one question. Um, about a different kind of uh, pressure that we're uh, experiencing in journalism today. We talked about uh, earlier when uh, uh, women journalists from uh, Croatian media were here. And um, I wanted to ask you if um, you had, um, um, what, uh, what is the economic side of uh, uh, eventual uh, pressure that you uh, might experience uh, while you work, uh, work um, not only for offshore leaks, but uh, um, usually. And uh, if you ca uh, can uh, give a um, broader picture of the uh, situation in Germany uh, from that aspect, you know, uh, economic pressure and existential uh, functioning. Um, yes, um, let me process that for a second. So f f for my very own person, I have the absolute luxury situation that I the whole time I was kind of financially independent. I had savings during the offshore leaks investigation from a former time when I was working for the German news agency, 
which paid a de decent salaries. So I put something aside. I had some funding for the state because it just became uh, a freelancer and they fund you for a certain time if you apply for that. Um, the only kind of pressure I ever experienced was political pressure in terms of that um, for at least a couple of nights there was the rumor that all my computer and hard drive would be seized uh, because it just wanted to have that hard drive with the information and I was the only or the only known visible person in Germany who had that hard drive and our financial minister was just you know crazy about that because uh, as media was developing the story, it was uncertain how much was on the hard drive, how much he would actually profit from having this information, and um, that the Americans, the British, and the Australian already had it. So it was also a thing of prestige and political, you know, importance to to have this hard drive. But luckily, this turned out to be, by German standards, something very <laughs> suicidal if you did that. So. Um, the rumor vanished and every digital asset returned to my home magically after that period. Um, but generally in Germany, the situation is coming from the financial side much subtle. Um, to afford a deep, thorough, investigative uh, story, you have to have a grant or a good financial backup from a magazine or from a you know, major news outlet which is rare in these times. Um, if um, maybe you know Der Spiegel, which is you know the most prominent magazine, if they do something, they pay decent. Even if there's a failure at the end of the story, that it doesn't turn out to be uh, as relevant or as uh, true or something. But for others, you can, if you have to choose between uh, a story about something funny or silly happening, um, about um, something that's relevant to technology but not relevant to everybody's life or even PR um, compared to doing an investigative story maybe cross-border maybe f financially exhausting then I can understand people not doing this kind of stressful stuff but instead doing the other thing which is you know just less resistance uh, just uh, easier and this is the only thing I see and it, um, I'm or I have been involved in the past with various circles of people trying to rethink how to change that in terms of maybe g uh, creating a foundation or maybe doing a European uh, uh, structure for investigative journalism, giving money for these kind of investigations if they're cross-border. Um, but it remains difficult to find a real formula or a real structure which supports that. And um, last sentence, I don't think that this is something the market can actually regulate, but I don't also think um, that there's any kind of perfect solution anywhere else. So as with experimentation, we might to try a few things and see what sticks. Okay. Uh as the title of the table is Future of Research Journalism. Uh, I wanted to ask you, both of you, maybe it is rather looking into the crystal ball, but what is the future of research journalism as it's being displaced from the newsrooms as uh, many, well, there, there's a growth of programs that are financing research journalistic projects. So, uh, and the infrastructure within the media is vanishing uh, how do you see what will happen to the research journalism and uh, where will it end up? Will it, in this, these conditions, remain in the traditional media formats or, I don't know, become translated into some other forms? Thank you. Well, I'm not worried optimistic about uh, investigation journalism in Croatia because, as you know, the uh, newspapers are just surviving, uh, fighting for uh, from day to day to survive. And uh, a lot of newspapers in Croatia, as you all know, uh, even the very important ones like Viesnik and uh, Nacional and some others has been closed. So uh, the, uh, now we have uh, our, our, our biggest fight today is the fight for, survive, for surviving. The, 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 
uh, newspapers are very poor. They don't have enough money for uh, uh, elementary uh, uh, work. Uh, but as you know, uh, investigating journalism is very expensive. You have to have a time, you have to have money, and also you have to have a space in the newspaper or, in the, or time in the uh, 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 television or radio. Uh, if you look into uh, to Croatian press today, you will see that there are just a few uh, newspapers or just a, who, who are able to uh, pay journalists enough uh, to, to do uh, very good and very uh, serious investigating stories. And I'm afraid that in the uh, next five or ten years situation wouldn't be better, even, even worse. Um. I second that for Germany as well. Um, I mean, we don't have such a dire situation, I think, with newspapers or media companies, but they're looking more and more at budget and at structure and at reducing. Um, and maybe I'm unfair to them, but just, just you know, that's my personal uh, view. Um, but I want to be a little bit more optimistic. There is a movement on general accountability and transparency in states and with communities. And like for my home, current hometown, Hamburg, we have an upcoming uh, transparency law where any contract and any kind of regulation uh, uh, by default is, has to be published uh, at a specific site so you can, as a journalist or as a citizen, review what is going on and who's paying whom what money. And if that kind of transparency helps at least to kind of level the access uh, for other people who can't invest that much time, who don't have the resources, um, then this might at least be a little band-aid for the local investigative stuff. As well for the um, global things, I think that um, organizations like the ISIJ or um, ProPublica or something are important. Um, the only thing is you don't have to um, misunderstand the concept of them because they're also cherry picking. They're looking before they run stories, before they do stuff. Is this interesting in public opinion or from public view? Does this work globally? And how how, how are uh, our success chances with stories? So um, this is only the t top of the iceberg what they're covering. Under the iceberg there's always more and this is the uh, thing that we lost. Maybe a question again to, to Mr. Head, Hedl. Um, there is a recent instrument by the Ministry of Culture for uh, research investigative uh, projects. Uh, what's your opinion of that? And do you see those forms of support maybe sustaining investigative journalism in the future. Um, and these are obviously small scale. They cannot replace uh, some of the functions that a newsroom of a publisher could provide. So where do you see, uh, you always said that newspapers are very poor and they can't pay people to work, but I guess they, even, they can even less pay other people to support the work of an investigative journalist. So uh, there is a definitely a lack in, existing lack in the newsrooms um, of fact checkers, of people who could uh, help uh, an investigative journalist uh, to bolster his story. Um, and with these projects, it's obviously the model is, is that it's mostly individual. Um, so what's your opinion of that? Uh, well, such initiatives which you mentioned are, of course, welcome. And uh, the Ministry of Culture, uh, I think it was for the first time this year that they uh, uh, provide some money for the investigating stories and uh, helping uh, to uh, keep this uh, form of uh, uh, journalistic work uh, on life. And uh, we'll see how it will work, but uh, anyway, it's a good uh, sign and I think that uh, uh, somebody in Croatia uh, is thinking that uh, uh, such kind of journalism is very important and uh, that we couldn't just uh, uh, stay on the uh, SMS uh, uh, information which you now 
can read in the, in the most of Croatian newspapers. Just a few words, just a big picture and a title which usually don't correspond with, uh, with the article. So I, I think it's a very good for, uh, it's a very good sign, but we'll see how it works. Hello. Um, there is a quite an delusionment uh, among the readership of the papers in, in Croatia uh, in terms of um, credibility of the of the newspaper uh, of the news uh, that we read there. So my question goes for the future of the impact of investigative journalism. So. Um, um, the, with the fragmentation of the of the of the media space on the internet and with the decrease in the impact of the of the press what uh, do you see as the future of the impact like do we uh, can we count with the um, a big affairs uh, that can top down um, functionaries or politicians in the future or do you think that investigative journalism can stay professional but without impact? Is it possible? Yeah. Um, just a second, trying to process the words. The thing is, from my point of view, um, I'm satisfied if I give people, readers, recipients, the chance for informed decision. If they're kept from the information, then I fail. If they don't act upon this, it's kind of a problem of them. I mean, it's with the text thing, you can just see, okay, some, some countries chose not to change anything at all. Where in France, even the, the, the president said, okay, we, we have to keep people in politics now transparent if they have offshore accounts or something. So they changed something. Does this need traditional media to happen? I don't think so. Traditional media, but can do more than you know, keep people um, informed about one thing, but give them the whole picture. So this is what their re relevancy would be like. Um, so I see for the future of investigative journalism that a few might be even able to pull off their own brand, as they say, to be become their own uh, uh, um, outlet as we see it with Greenwald and Portress through Intercept now, with the Snowden investigations, they're so highly visible that they're a, new, a media company themselves. Um, as for others, they might have Im impact locally because internet is replacing local traditional media even in Germany. This is all I can anticipate. Uh, well, uh, answering to a question, I will tell you one joke. Uh, it was a conversation between Franja Tuđman and uh, Napoleon in the heaven. So Tuđman told to Napoleon, if I would have army like yours, I will fight the Serbs uh, uh, and the Yugoslav army in a couple of days. And uh, Napoleon told him, if I would have media like yours, uh, nobody would ever heard for the water wall. Uh, so I think uh, impact of the, of the, of the uh, investigative stories are very big because in Croatia, uh, uh, journalists are I would say maybe not now, but uh, five or ten years before, always in front of the state prosecutor, in front of the police, in front of the investigation. If some uh, stories wouldn't appear in the newspapers, I, I, I'm sure that it would uh, have an uh, impact uh, on the uh, situation which, which, uh, which change, which the, the media change the situation. <coughs> Drago and ask Drago does he see the gap in local journalism in this country when we are when we come to things like uh, our colleague just explained in the sense that there's no uh, data experts like like Sebastian no internet experts like Sebastian and that the local methods at all yeah, my answer will be similar to the one which I gave when you asked me uh, about the future of the investigative journalism. I think that uh, we are now fighting for surviving and uh, uh, that uh, we don't have enough capacity. Also, uh, uh, the newspapers are not uh, 
they don't have a feeling uh, that the journalist uh, should learn all the time. We should go to the conferences, uh, we should uh, uh, meet people like uh, uh, our German friends today to learn more and to uh, uh, learn about the, the new tools which we all uh, uh, used, uh, which we all have to, to know how to use. Uh, so I think it's a big gap between uh, journalism in Croatia and in uh, Germany or, or, or Britain or United States. Uh, uh, and the reason is because the newspapers uh, here are really, really poor. Sebastian, do you have an idea how to, how to implement uh, the, the methods that you use into the uh, small countries with no funds, with no money, with, with very poor media? How to do it? Um, <laughs> interesting. Um, I was, maybe I can, can I just borrow a minute to, to tell you something? But I, I had a, um, when I started 2007, moving from the university into full-time journalism, I was part of a meeting of the prediction how German media would develop. And it was like, there will be a lot of uh, newspapers disappearing. We were talking about like 60 to 80% in the next 20 years. Uh, their names and even the journalists would disappear. There would be concentration and there would be a refocus. So everybody was scared and they were thinking like, yeah, and what will the media market be? And the prediction was, you either have boulevard or you will have quality, but nothing in between. If you kind of mix that stuff, if you have local journalism and a little bit investigative and a little bit of that, then you won't succeed. And actually, that is happening. I mean, I see some really good quality newspapers are uh, still surviving or even doing better. I mean, the newspaper I work for is increasing in readership. And I don't think they really can say they 100% sure uh, how they do it, but it just happens because they have good quality journalism. And for Boulevard, it's thriving in the internet. Everybody reads celebrity gossip stories about what's happening, what's cool, what's flashy. And between, there is a void. and. If you scale it down, and this is how I could answer your, your uh, uh, question a little bit, if you scale it down to smaller countries, because the volume of readership is important, there is this problem that there might be only, if one uh, space for one quality magazine who rules it all, and if this is enough, I don't know. Um, uh, in terms of also how to train people, how to you know, um, get people into this job, um, so maybe you have to upscale to European level and say we need a European kind of investigative journalism school or something. We need something that has the um, amount and the, the range that you can send people to where they get changed, uh, uh, trained and, and exchange ideas and then come back and do it locally. Um, but this would be just, you know, uh, an, a first th thought for um, reducing the problem of the scale of smaller countries. If they join together, throw together money and, you know, train people. Um, but the other way would be make at least tools and knowledge more available, which is happening at least in data journalism, not in investigative journalism, but in data journalism. Um, the European Journalism Center is starting free classes next month with experts in, in this field and everybody can participate, either if he or she is a real journalist or a citizen, um, which doesn't scale to investigative or to, uh, to investigative journalism or research journalism, but might be something that can be built upon to actually get into this area. I don't know. Thank you. To continue this debate uh, between the institutional, you ask about the need of institutional setting for investigative journalism and journalists. Uh, and in opposition to that, what about this uh, freelancing alone at home and so on? And I would like to ask you about The Guardian, for instance, and you mentioned Greenwald. So the, the uh, setup of institution, big, newspaper uh, uh, 
hosting investigative journalism and journalists and providing framework and then they go away like Greenwald establishing now own media and getting huge money to do that or Simon Jenkins data editor of The Guardian famous Guardian publish data uh, how to say open source uh, uh, software for the audience and so on and the guys symbolizing that then leave for uh, YouTube or where somewhere to California so uh, what do you think about this you know uh, in my opinion uh, I, I vote for Guardian and not for Greenwald as a as a person yes. and now when I visit the platform he has now established as a new media it's bullshit it's nothing okay. maybe they will improve I'm sure they will improve but to run even the online media like one man band two man band he's uh, recruiting or it can be ten man band but it's not the guardian with hundreds and, and, and institution and kind of, as, as somebody said, fact-checking peer colleagues to talk in the morning, read my article, tell me what, and so on. What do you think about these relations? There, there are many facets to your interesting uh, question. Um, I'll try to um, pinpoint something by a German example. Um, I, I'm sorry that I missed the colleague from Tuts here. But Tats as a German newspaper is considered the best space to learn journalism and do good journalism. And then they move somewhere else. Um, so they have the same problem as The Guardian um, in relation to, to some prominent people. Um, uh, once the people get really good there, they're hired somewhere else and thrive there and get there even more famous. Um, but they still have the time with these people as The Guardian did with their uh, with Greenwald and, su and such. So from the point of The Guardian, it's more managing uh, new or attracting um, new talents than you know, keeping the old ones for any kind of condition. If they can't keep it, well, new people will come. I mean, Greenwald is stuck, I think, for life with this NSA theme. At least that's what it is looking like now. But The Guardian has to keep up with interest and um, actually, it's the same with offshore leaks, what we experienced after two weeks of everyday uh, tax evasion stories, people lose really interest in that stuff. I mean, they get really bored, um, no matter how important it is. So um, having, uh, um, how would I say that figuratively, 100 horses in a stable and losing one is not really a big issue uh, if you keep them all well. Um, so this thing. And the other thing, the other way around, I think it's good that you have the alternative to, if you are working at one specific thing, to go away from a media house if you're so prominent and work on one, one thing at all. It might not look like Greenwald is doing um, the same thing now than he did at The Guardian, but as far as I can see it from the very distance, he's working in a very, very stressful, very complicated circumstances like uh, as far as I can see it from this distance, there is no such as Snowden material in Great Britain anymore because it was seized or erased. And what he has has to be protected at any cost. So it's kind of not the thing that we work like um, in the open or even maybe in a secret office, but under more security than you can imagine. So the output is far slower and um, the outcome is not really certain if, if, if it works at all. Okay, just a short uh, maybe contribution to the discussion from the reader's point, point of view. As Drago said, I think today um, it is more possible to write anything about anybody than maybe 20 years ago. But what I see as an unfortunate consequence of the projectification of investigative journalism where you have different um, 
uh, website portals, etc., publishing all this material, investigative, investigating separately, working on different stories, uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get an overall picture of what's going on in the country where you can either professionally follow all these separate news sources, um, reading the newspapers, watching the news, and then complementing it with all these independent sources. Uh, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to become a uh, well-informed citizen. That's sort of the danger of the projectification process, I think, right now, where you have to supplement the information the whole time. And then from time to time, it's difficult to judge whether you know, the journalists publishing it are credible or not, and their sources, et cetera. So that's a little comment on that. And a friend of mine has this uh, conspiration theory that um, investigative journalism is not getting uh, eradicated or drowned, but instead they create so much noise everywhere else that you can't see it anymore. This look like creating smoke screen. And um, to defute that, I, I think the internet is so big that it would actually fail to create smoke all over the internet, but there's so much dis distraction and so much everything else that reader attention span has been diversified to, to an end where you, when you have your important story, you only exist at a tiny moment for their attention span. And if you don't really catch on with a good Google optimized uh, headline and everything else in the first paragraph, then you kind of disappear from their conscience. And um, I fear these moments for all my articles or for all my contributions. It's a problem that actually is overall the journalism for now. So, uh, Mr. Heddles mentioned that uh, the problem with Croatian media is that they do not have enough money for investigative uh, journalism and the future of the investigative journalism is not so bright. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you mentioned open source uh, intelligence. I would mention uh, crowdsourcing and actually a uh, completely different approach that would avoid actual you know, uh, problem with media and uh, the fact that today's uh, journalists who should work, they work, uh, lose their cred credentials actually uh, among general public. So what's your opinion about from one point uh, crowdsourcing as a big uh, potential for the future journalism and uh, on the other hand uh, you mentioned open source intelligence so can you say a, a few more words about that? Okay. okay. Um, reverse order. Uh, so open source intelligence is something since it's open source and you have to attract uh, people to the idea by making it sexy. It's something that you can't really do with money if you have no money and even if you have money, um, 10 mediocre programmers don't count as one brilliant one. So you have to create a real challenge that is sexy for IT people to actually solve. And um, since I said the time scale, two to three years, that's optimistic. The problem is good people in IT always get hired away by companies paying decent money, having digital playgrounds as you see with Google and Microsoft. So mm, I'm, I don't know if this work will work out. With crowdsourcing, it's, it's a two-step problem. The first problem is promising something that you d are not sure that will, you will deliver or that you can't talk about is something that really can't be funded that well. I mean, if I have, uh, as we see with, this is the most prominent name, but there are others, Kickstarter, um, for in culture uh, or for physical things to say, I will produce this if you give me the promise of paying for it or if you donate something, money for the cost, that works. With, with journalism, it's problematic to say, I will do, do a story about environment, but I can tell you more because it's secret. Then it was becoming a problem. And if you delay the payment to the end of it, um, we'll now see that um, donating money to stories, as a colleague of mine recently wrote in a German article, becomes more a button of, uh, I like you uh, trashing this person, or I like you 
bitching about this than quality journalism. People are more uh, uh, inclined to give money to specific articles or courses if there's something that is uh, actually um, uh, challenging to their social views or, or, or uh, creating a fuss, then it is quality, like it is structured and it's intelligent and it's, you know, good journalism, which they find kind of difficult that this doesn't really create a business model. So maybe we can over time change this by, I don't know, this is not the best sentence to, expl to, to express it, uh, educating our readers. I don't know if that works, but maybe it doesn't work at all with, with that funding. I, I would argue actually against this, this, that situation is so bad. I've followed recently, uh, out of personal interests, Kickstarter and the projects that are dealing specifically with media and, and crowdsourcing and long-form journalism. And there have been successes, especially uh, if these projects were not starting from scratch, but uh, they had authors who had previous references. So there was this uh, magazine that I've been following called Matter who's been like super successful in raising really quickly a lot of money and then for a specific niche of kind of long form uh, journalism. And I think that could be maybe exception uh, of the rule that, that it's super easy to do it quickly, but it's uh, not exception to the point that it's impossible. I think it just uh, needs to create uh, a demand, a niche, which could be, I don't know, Croatian long form uh, magazine, it could be like topic specific uh, international magazine, but it, it's not so impossible to imagine. I second you on that because I funded this magazine as well as with a small donation, but the, um, what they promised was only like long form and not specific topically or, or even from location where they would do their stories. But um, certain readers demand um, that something is about their thing or about their area, about their life. And this is why for smaller uh, regions or smaller structures, it doesn't work that well, what I anticipate at least. Maybe a question for the moderator, for Boris. Uh, so you are working in a newsroom, uh, you work for Novel East, um, the same newspaper as Ladislav, who presented this morning. And mm, it seems that uh, these kinds of leaks uh, seem to complement or s maybe substitute, but let's say complement, a part of uh, journalist work or something that was staple of journalist work and that is doing the analysis and trying to find insider information. So how do you see that from the point of view of the newsroom? Has ha, Have these revelations, so for instance, cable uh, leak by the WikiLeaks included some of some of uh, the communiques related to, to Croatian situation. Has that fed into, into uh, the work within the newspaper to do some analysis around that uh, piece of information. Um, so maybe this is more a comment than a question, but I think yeah. that it's always uh, hard to sell the story from outside to a certain newspapers. Because you have, Drago could co comment also, you, you always have at E editors who have their own uh, way of thinking and so on, and they and they usually don't like anybody else to, g to to come and say I have something very which is very very good, which means that that they didn't invent them themselves, you know. So uh, in my uh, in, uh, newspapers and I think in uh, newspapers in this country, they are not open enough to. The to the outside I investigations, to freelance investigations, and so on, which is, of course, not good. When we are talking about WikiLeaks, of course, there were some tips that uh, uh, 
that were used in our own investigations, but that's uh, something else. Drago, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. We seem to have exhausted. Oh, there. The, move the uh, conversation uh, from this um, uh, global situation and uh, predictions and um, to more maybe personal um, thoughts of you uh, for your um, profession. So uh, after these um, years that you've been uh, working uh, in journalism, uh, what do you think about your job and uh, your environment and um, uh, I'm thinking of this uh, um, research that we've, uh, we've been um, seeing some results uh, yesterday and uh, uh, before. And uh, what do you um, think uh, of your job? You know, um, did you want to uh, go away or uh, leave the job or, you know, some personal thoughts of, of two of you? Please, thank you. Well, I'm too old to leave away, so I have to stay uh, for a while in the newspapers. Well, what, what do I think about my job? Well, um, uh, it's hard to say because um, journalism is job as any other job. So you don't have, a, I, I don't have a right to complain because I have troubles do, do, uh, doing my job. It will be the same as the sailor with complain because the sea is rough. So. Uh, it was my choice, and I uh, wanted to uh, make a story sometimes which other journalists didn't want to do. Uh, I should have much better position uh, writing about uh, other things like uh, like uh, pop stars, like uh, football uh, players, like uh, people from uh, red carpet. But I didn't uh, choose that, so I uh, I don't have a reason to I don't have a right to complain because of that. Uh, I think that. Uh, uh, journalism in our time is very important, especially in Croatia, because we change, I, maybe I'm going to say something which uh, you wouldn't accept, but I think that we change the society, uh, slowly. It wasn't uh, overnight. Uh, we uh, open many things which uh, uh, shouldn't be uh, open otherwise. And uh, I think that uh, Croatian journalism, especially some uh, newspapers uh, in the last uh, at, the, at the end at the, at the end of last century did a good job because we made a better society thanks to to the journalists and also thanks to the newspapers and the television and uh, uh, and the other media maybe uh, i'm not right but i hope that some of you will will uh, accept my opinion okay um looking back to the year 2000 when I started studying journalism and I was 30 by that time and had 10 years of mixed IT and beginner's journalism uh, done. I was thinking I would go to radio and do film reviews and moderate a few radio shows and all of my brilliant uh, students who were starting with me would become investigative stars or, or even, you know, really the big ones. Um, now it turns out to be no one really became a big person in, in uh, national media, but everybody got somewhere else where they didn't plan to be because um, most of them, what happened was reality and media changed, but some also got infected by something that changed a job or a career wish to a kind of calling, which is ideal when you do something you consider important and you don't really complain about all the problems that come with it and so long as I think my work feels like a calling and not like you know a career or a opportunity to make money it's perfect but if this changes I might look for the next calling instead of staying in journalism to be blunt um, because it's um, from a very egoistic point of view it's my only life that I have on this earth and uh, why should I give it um, for uh, you know something just to make money with? I want to do something fun. I want to do something that 
changes things, at least for me, or uh, changes things the way I wanted to have changed if I wasn't uh, there. Um, so this is my view on things. But as for investigative journalism, I see that no, not really a huge amount of people consider their calling. It, it happens for them and then they stick with it, which is all okay. Um, one more maybe technocratic question. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in uh, what is your uh, opinion on the platforms that try to mediate uh, needs of investigative journalism or, or let's say, activist uh, journalism. Uh, there has been recently a trend uh, in organizing uh, these platforms, um, especially, for example, the Yes Men uh, established this, uh, the Action Switch Board. There was this uh, peer-reviewed hypothesis uh, uh, website that tries to do a lot with an annotation. Um, is, is there a kind of a, a, a path in, in uh, establishing a platform that could mediate and administrate this kind of work like, like Marcel was explaining yesterday that Amazon did for, for booksellers, that it could kind of streamline the process and, and kind of uh, at least remove the redundancy of, of uh, everyone doing all the same work which is not uh, focused on the content and on the research. Sadly, I can't say anything about that, but, um, and the reason for that is just this focus thing there. Um, I see this happening, I, s I read about it, and then I forget about it because my specific problem, my specific structure doesn't include this kind of platforms. Uh, I see them once in a year in, in conferences, maybe at Republica, maybe at the German investigative journalism meeting, but sorry, it doesn't jump into my focus right now. Maybe this tells you something about these prompt platforms, they are really niche, and they might work, but not for me. Um, okay, I don't know, will this end up as a comment or as a question? But uh, regarding the, the problem with the economic aspect of funding uh, investigative journalism as an extremely expensive discipline, um, it also refers to other forms that are disappearing from the media as reporting and uh, alike. Um, I think that maybe uh, what is impacting strongly the, this uh, types of uh, forms, journalistic forms, uh, which actually fulfill the public function of the media, is the uh, media being intertwined with the uh, economic and political elites. And that this is somehow preventing the, the independence of media, and that it's rather in their interest to diminish the dangerous things, which uh, the dangerous context contents that could uh, destabilize their position rather than just the, the economic factor of uh, expensive uh, project or expensive uh, kind of work. comment on the comment. Um, as me working with data, I can to this point say that I never came close to anybody important, so I was never kind of influenced by anything. I mean, I saw passports of prominent people and Chinese politicians and something, but it didn't really influence my life or change my decision to work with that stuff. I see it with other journalists I now uh, interact with that the only way to play the game is to play the game. Um, if you start breaking the rules, then you're out of the game. So their decision uh, when interacting with politics is mostly, well, to stay in the game. Um, and as long as the others are still playing it, there's no way to actually escape this rule set. So this is kind of um, a really complex situation, also from the public view. Um, when 
uh, investigative journalists uh, have talks together with politicians in back rooms to get background knowledge, but don't report about it or keep half of this uh, secret or, or obscure. Well, uh, just to correct, uh, I probably put it unclear enough. Uh, I didn't think of journalists okay. as being intertwined with the politics, okay. but the media and yeah. media policies which prevent development and sustain sustainability of research journalism. I didn't want to just imply that research okay. journalists are okay. Okay. corrupt. So maybe uh, we end on this note. Um, I'd like to thank Drago Hedl, Boris Pavlovich, and Sebastian Mondial for this session. Thank you. There are some snacks and there is coffee served outside. And um, in about 20 minutes, we are going to start with um, a conference lecture, conference call lecture by uh, Robert McChesney. Uh, renowned um, theorist of media and um, I guess critical scholar um, and he will be speaking about uh, media reform internet and post-capitalist democracy so see you in a little bit